now have uh, Human Sapi from Harvard. Thanks, organizers, for the opportunity. A major question in neuroscience is to understand what components of the sensory and behavior variables are represented <laughs> in the neural activity. With the increase in the complexity of the experiments, more complex sensory inputs are used, and larger set of behavior variables are being recorded and studied in the neural representations. This increase in the dimensionality of the neural variates increases the complexity of the neural encoding problem simply because we are facing to compute larger correlation and interac interaction structures between all the variables contributing to the neural representation. And this is the main issue I'm going to talk today. So as an example, if we want to infer whether a particular variable of interest is actually represented in the neural response, or whether its correlation with the neural activity is a consequence of its covariation with other variables in the task, we need models which have enough information about the full dependency structure. And for example, here, the first order direct dependencies would not be enough to distinguish between these two information pathways. Similarly, in the population level, interactions and correlations here between neurons are play an important role in the information processing and the population code. By knowing how neurons are correlating within a population, both in the level of signal and noise components, we can not only isolate the contribution of the interactions in the population information, but we can also break it down into individual interaction orders and motifs, such as pairs, triplets, or higher order uh, interactions corresponding to multiple scales of connectivity in the neural circuit. So a big goal in computational neuroscience is to develop more powerful models of multivariate interaction structures for neural representations. And to see the challenge to address this problem, we can simply define it in the language of the maximum entropy, which to estimate a probabilistic model, we start by defining a set of constraints on the aspects of the statistics which we want to consider. For example, here, the expected value of the response is considered to be a linear function of a set of predictors, but by increasing the complexity of the dependencies or the order of the interactions which we include in the model, we will then face the problem of the curse of dimensionality, which simply means that we would need exponentially large samples to be able to estimate all these parameters and the higher order moments from the data. And for this reason, then, we are forced to limit the models and constraints and to make a strong assumptions by simply ignoring the higher order interactions or nonlinear dependencies. So here, the goal would be to try to improve this and uh, define models which allows us to compute more general higher order interactions using limited sample sizes in non-parametric way. And in the rest of my talk, I'm proposing wine copula as a potential, potential approach satisfying uh, these properties. So to achieve this goal, we can first focus on the interaction part of the probability distribution by using the scalars theorem, which simply states that any multivariate density function can be factorized as a product of a marginal distributions and the density of the CDF values of the data, or as it's called, the copula. And this decomposition hugely simplifies and shrinks the space of the constraints by getting rid of the irrelevant and, and unnecessary degrees of freedom corresponding to the marginals. In fact, we can show that the copula subspace in the space of probabilities can embed any general constraint set with arbitrary degree of nonlinearity and interaction. To visualize this decomposition here, I just show two example data sets, which after decomposing the copula from these two different uh, two-dimensional data sets with very different correlation structure using uh, non-parametric local likelihood methods, we can see the full dependency structure and the difference in the correlations between the data completely captured by the differences in the copula structures while the data shares similar marginal distribution. And more importantly, the copula, the entropy of the copula completely quantifies the level of the correlation between the variables because it's equal to the mutual information. In the multivariate case, however, estimating a, dimensional, a multidimensional copula suffers from the same problem of the curse of dimensionality. And what, what makes this approach practically possible is that we can break down a multivariate copula density into a product of a set of conditional bivariate copulas. And this can be done in a graphical representation name as the wine decomposition, which here an example for dimensional case is shown, in which the wine structure consists of a set of graphs corresponding to different orders of interactions and conditioning of the copula densities. And it's important to note that this uh, decomposition reduces the exponential complexity of the problem to second order 
and makes it possible to estimate the high dimensional copula density using limited sample sizes. And there exists the, the, the sequential procedure which can be used on the data to estimate uh, higher order uh, components in this decomposition. Which here, I show an example four dimensional case. In, the, in this example, the data points shapes the nodes of the first layer of the wine structure from which we can then compute the first order copulas as the, uh, the dependency structure between uh, pairs of the nodes in the, in the first layer of the wine. And from there, we can use the fitted first order copulas to then estimate the first order conditional probabilities of the data points, which then they shape the nodes of the second layer of the wine structure. And then they, we can fit then the second order conditional copula and continue this procedure basically to the highest possible interaction order uh, in the data. And the product of all these sequential fit forward computed by varied components basically shape the high dimensional copula density, which after mixing that with the marginal distributions, we get the high dimensional density function over the data. In order to demonstrate some of the applications of the wine copula here, I show some analysis on the data collected by Selman Ishte in Harvey lab, which uh, in this experiment, the mouse is running in a wine maze in virtual reality environment and is supposed to do a left-right turn after seeing a black or white cue on the wall. And uh, hundreds of neurons in, from V1 and posterior parietal cortex together with the nine-dimensional uh, running and position behavior variable have been recorded during the experiment. And using the wine copula fitted to a joint distribution of all these variables, we ask how the neural activity can be modeled in terms of these correlated variables and also how the interactions in the population contribute to the information. So as the first application, we can use the wine copula as a generative model to estimate response distributions. And uh, using this response distribution, we can estimate the expected response together with higher order moments of the data, such as the empirical variance as a measure of neural uncertainty. Here an example trace of the fitted response together with the variance explained using a GLM, a pairwise copula, which simply means using only the first layer of the wine structure, and the full copula is shown, and the result shows the importance of both higher order and nonlinear interactions in the neural representation. One very important application of the wine modeling is that we can generate realistic samples from the wine structure, keeping the full interaction structure of the data through a reverse sequential procedure as the one I just explained before for the density estimation. And we can use then these samples in, in a Mon Monte Carlo in the estimation and compute the high dimensional entropies and the mutual information between high dimensional variables. And here, for example, on the data, if we want to infer whether the trial type is represented in the neural activity, we would need to discount its correlation with the nine-dimensional behavior variable in the neural representation. And this can be done by computing the mutual information between trial type and the nine-dimensional behavior variables with and without the, uh, joining the neural activity. And after using the mutual information chain rule, we can then compute the conditional mutual information between the neural activity and the trial type, which will be the measure for inferring the discounted representation of trial type in the neural activity. Here, an example neuron uh, just show. And the wine copula density estimation make this high dimensional information calculation possible without making any parametric assumption or dimensional reduction over the data. As another application, we can also build a wine model for a population of neurons and to model the interaction structure between the neural activities in the population. The entropy of the joint copula density will be correspond to the interaction information, which after mixing that with the independent information computed from the marginal distributions, we get the full population information. We can also look to the entropies embedded in the nodes within a particular layer of the wine structure to basically break down the interaction information into individual interaction orders. On the data, we first ask how the full and independent information about trial type are scaling with increasing population size. And as we can see, a saturation in the full population information for population sizes larger than around 40. But then if we look to the interaction information, which is the difference between the full population information and the independent information, we see in general a synergistic interaction component with a maximum value for population sizes between 20 and 30. Also, if we now break down the interaction information into different network structures or interaction orders, 
as it's expected, the highest contribution comes from the pairwise component, but we see a significant component for higher order interactions from triplets to, to interaction orders as large as 15. And I have to note that it's important that uh, ignoring these high order uh, interaction terms can lead to large underestimation of the population information corresponding to this uh, green area here. Finally, we look to the possible behavioral relevance of this interaction information by computing the interaction information for correct and in incorrect trials. And we see a significant larger interaction information in correct trials in the PPC, while we didn't see any such difference in the visual cortex. And this suggests the possible functional difference for the correlations in these two areas. And at the end, these results suggest the importance of studying higher order interactions in the population code. And I would like to thank all the members of Christopher Harvey lab and Stefano Panzeri's lab, uh, which the work has been done as a collaboration. Thank you very much. We have time for a couple questions. Thank you. That was a full talk. Um, I had a question about um, the estimates of the information. I think a lot of times there's biases in entropy estimates based on the amount of data you have. Do you find that if you are fitting your models differently with subsets of the data, you'll find different results? Or could you comment yeah, on that? Yeah, but we didn't do any systematic study on the effect of the bias with respect to the error because of the difference in the sample sizes. But for the fixed sample sizes, basically the information is computed by the convergence of the, 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 the variance of the Monte Carlo estimation of the information. I expect there should be an error, but I don't know. That's an error because of the error in the estimation of the density function, not because of the bias corresponding to the sample size. It's, it's a different type, two types of bias, but we haven't done a systematic uh, study on we're, that. We're uh, asking folks to stay for the closing remarks. I don't know if anyone who's walking out now could let the people let the people in the uh, lobby know that they're welcome to come to the closing remarks. The shuttles are not here yet, so there's no urgency. Stay. Um, so it seemed to me that um, kind of the major advance here is the idea that these fine copulas are sort of a parameter-free way of estimating the uh, empirical CDF of the whole data. But it seems like it's just kind of burying the problem because now you have to fit all of your copulas and that's going to, the, the way and the shape of how you do that is going to be implicitly imposing some, um, some bias or maybe in some way, shape, or form priors on what the shape of the ECDF is, or the, the CDF of a joint distribution is, right? Um, and I was wondering if you could explain maybe a little bit more how this isn't actually Im implicitly imposing a lot of structure on the, inter the form of the interactions. It imposes some structure based on the assumption of the model of the wine graph which you assume, but there are ways to basically look into the different types of graphical models which is fitted <laughs> best to the data. And I would say that at the end of the day, it's a model with lots of more degrees of freedom for estimating a, dense, a high dimensional density function with respect to the conventional one. But there are still a lot of things to study in what type of uh, basically the, the confounds is generated by making a particular assumption on the graphical model. Yeah. But I don't think those are, I mean, those are like minimal effects with respect to the general uh, the, the degree of uh, uh, explanation of the variability in the data, I would say. Hi, thank you very much. Very, very interesting talk. So the, uh, you showed that uh, the effect of the higher order ap appears at in the middle of the population size and uh, a want to understand your uh, interpretations for this. Why usually, you know, if you increase the number of, si number of neurons, the, the higher order interaction may play a lot more role. So you mean to the, to the, to the, the effect of the interaction information, basically, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, middle one, one. the middle one. So the middle one basically should decay because both of the full population and the independent information are going to be saturating to the full information here. So it's a very simple task, it's a one bit of information. So at the end, you should end up uh, having zero 
interaction information at some point. I so I, I think I misunderstand. Yeah. So you have an upper bound of the, this one means, uh, can, can you repeat what? Yeah, so that's a one bit of information about the, the that's an information about the trial type. Uh -huh. So both of the okay. full and the independent information are saturating by increasing the population size. Yeah. So if you want to encode more um, larger uh, uh, variable information, yeah. then this may Maybe yeah, I don't know. I don't have any idea. Okay. I mean, I don't have any idea how, where does this like 20 to 30 population size come from even here. Yeah, that's. Okay, thank you very much. Any uh, um, thoughts on how the brain reads out the higher order uh, correlations? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's a way we reach out to the representation of the activity, but I don't know if this type of representation is actually represented really in, the, in terms of the real responses in the neuron. That, that I don't know. That's like an indirect way of reading out uh, what's going on, yeah. Okay, let's uh, thank Clement again. And, uh